today we're going to talk about organic compounds. Previously, we had talked about inorganic compounds and said that inorganic compounds were usually simpler and they did not contain both carbon and hydrogen. On the flip side, organic compounds are compounds that contain both carbon and hydrogen atoms in them. So when you look at their chemical formula, the chemical formula will have a C and it will also have an H. It doesn't mean that it's only limited to those two types of atoms, but they have to have at least carbon and hydrogen in the formula. So we're going to look at some of the different types of organic compounds that are known. There are four main types that we discuss in living environment. They are the carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. One thing that you might think about is trying to come up with some sort of a memory tool in order to remember what the four types of organic compounds are. Maybe come up with some sort of a mnemonic or a funny sentence or something like that in order to help you remind what they are. The first organic compound that we're going to be talking about are the carbohydrates. For each of the organic compounds, we're going to discuss four main things. We're going to discuss the elements or types of atoms that are found in that organic compound. We're going to discuss the building blocks, the uses in living organisms, and then some examples. In terms of carbohydrates, you've probably heard that word before. I usually like to start with carbohydrates because it's typically one of the more familiar organic compounds. What do you think of when you think of carbohydrates? Do you know an abbreviation for it or a slang word for it? Well, we'll get into a little bit and we'll see how you do. The elements that are typically found in a carbohydrate include carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Those are the only three that you'll see. So when you look at the chemical formula for a carbohydrate, you'll only see those three types of elements in it. One example of a carbohydrate is glucose. Its chemical formula is C6H12. O6. Notice it only has C, H, and O. You might want to write that example down. That was one that we use a lot. So that was glucose, C6, H12, O6. One other thing to notice when you look at the chemical formula for a carbohydrate, the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen atoms is always 2 to 1. So in our example of glucose that had C6, H12O6, when you look at the ratio of hydrogen to add oxygen atoms, it was 12 to 6. If you reduce that down, you get a ratio of 2 to 1. The building blocks of carbohydrates are called simple sugars. Simple sugars we could also call single sugars, or one that's only made up of one sugar compound. We'll get to some of those examples in a second. The uses in organisms for carbohydrates are pretty varied. The main thing that we talk about with carbohydrates is that most organisms use it as a primary fuel or their main energy source, especially in humans. Carbohydrates make up cell structures. We'll get some examples in a minute. And they're also used as stored energy in plants. A lot of plants that you probably eat in terms of vegetables, you're actually eating that plant's stored energy source in terms of starch. Potatoes are a great example of a plant's stored energy. Some examples of carbohydrates. There are three main types of carbohydrates that we discuss. They are the monosaccharides, the disaccharides, and the polysaccharides. Mono, do you know what mono means? Mono means one. And the root word, saccharides. Maybe you can think about a word that you've heard before like saccharin. Does anybody know what saccharin is? It might ring a bell for you and help you to remember that saccharides, anytime you see that part of that word, will help you to remember that those are the carbohydrates, which sometimes we refer to as just sugars. So the first class of carbohydrates, the monosaccharides, include glucose and fructose. Those are the most common ones. Many of you have heard of glucose before, which we used in our example before. It's one of the main simple sugars that we have. And then the other one is fructose. Think about what that word even sounds like. Do you know where fructose is found? Fructose is found in fruits. That's the sugar that's naturally found in fruits. Our second class are the disaccharides. Can you think of what di means? In this case, di means two. If we put two monosaccharides together in a simple reaction, 
we'll get a disaccharide or two simple sugars put together. Some common examples of disaccharides are maltose and sucrose. Maltose is made up of two glucose molecules and sucrose is our common table sugar that we use to put in things like your coffee and tea. The third class of carbohydrates are our polysaccharides. Maybe you know what poly means. Can you remember? Poly means two or more. In this case, we're gonna talk about three or more, actually. So polysaccharides will have at least three sugars put together. The examples of polysaccharides that we know of in living things that we'll discuss a couple of times this year are chitin, which makes up the exoskeleton or outer skeleton of things like lobsters and shrimp, starch, which we already talked about as that stored energy in plants, cellulose, which maybe some of you have heard of before, that makes up the cell wall in plants, and glycogen. Glycogen is what humans store some extra carbohydrates in their liver as, as a quick energy reserve. Let's move on after carbohydrates. We can talk about lipids. Lipids is another class of organic compounds, and we'll talk about the same elements for lipids as we did for carbohydrates. So our elements that we find in lipids are actually the same as carbohydrates. You can see that we only have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But one of the ways to tell the difference between a lipid and a carbohydrate if you're looking at the chemical formula is that now, instead of the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen being two to one as it was in carbohydrates, it's now going to be greater than two to one. One of the reasons for that is we use lipids as an energy source, stored energy. And the lipids have building blocks of fatty acids and glycerol. Those fatty acids are just really long chains of carbon and hydrogen molecules. And every time we break those bonds, we release some energy, which is where they get all that energy from. The uses of lipids in the body, the main use, stored energy in animals. If we have any, ener any energy left over in our bodies, we typically will store that as lipids, which a lot of people think of just as fats, but it's more than fats. We'll get to that in a second. The other use for lipids in our bodies and in living organisms is to make up the cell membrane. One of the main parts of the cell membrane are lipids, and that's what helps to make that cell membrane very flexible and fluid-like. Another use for lipids in living organisms for plants is the coating on the leaves. They have a coating called a cuticle. It's a waxy layer that helps to make them waterproof and also protect them from the elements. So some examples of our lipids. There are three main examples or types of lipids out there. The fats, oils, and waxes. When you think of fats, you might think of animal fat, which a lot of times is usually a solid at room temperature. And there are different types of fats or different types of lipids even. We call them saturated and unsaturated. We'll discuss that a little bit more later on. The oils, we typically think of them being as liquids at room temperature. Those are typically more from our vegetable sources or plant sources. And then waxes. Think of waxes in terms of what you might think of as candles or paraffin. Those are our waxes. The next main thing that we talk about with organic compounds as an example are proteins. That's our third type. Many of you have heard of proteins and typically what do you think of when you think of proteins? Many people think of muscles. There are other things that proteins make up in our body besides muscle. We'll get to those in a second. We need to talk about the elements first. You notice we now have a new addition to our elements. Instead of just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, we now have a new element added and that's nitrogen. That's what the N is, nitrogen. A lot of times I try to remember it as CHON, C-H-O-N, for our proteins. If you look at the word protein, there's an N in proteins, kind of to help you remember that that's one of the ones that has nitrogen in it. The building blocks for proteins get to be a little bit more complex. The building block of proteins are amino acids. So when we're putting together a protein, we're now going to chain together amino acids. And in the case of living organisms, there are 20 different kinds of amino acids, and they all follow the same general formula. On one end, there's a nitrogen attached to two hydrogen atoms. That's called an amino group. There's a carbon in the middle attached to a hydrogen. On the opposite end, there's a carbon 
with a double bond, which we'll discuss at one point, attached to an O and an H. That's called a carboxyl group. And then there's this R at the top. The R is there because it's called a variable group, or that's the group that changes. So every amino acid is going to follow this same basic formula except for that R. The most basic thing you could put in that R would be an H. You could put in carbons attached to hydrogens and oxygens and all sorts of other things differently arranged. That will give you your 20 different amino acids. The uses in the body or living organisms for proteins are quite varied. One of the first ones are chemical messengers. And the example we have are hormones. We'll talk about the uses of hormones later. I'm sure many of you have heard of hormones before. One other use is to make up the cell membrane. Remember we said lipids make up the cell membrane and help to make it flexible. In the case of proteins, the proteins are useful for receptors and transport channels in order to help things move in and out of the cell. Proteins also help to control or regulate chemical reactions, and those compounds that regulate chemical reactions are called enzymes. We're going to be discussing those in quite detail later. Another use are for cell structures. One of the cell structures out of the many is your hair. The last one is for immunity. If you encounter some sort of an organism that can cause disease in your body, your immune system is going to help fight that off with things called antibodies, and antibodies are made of proteins. Our very last organic compound type that we're going to discuss are the nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are probably a new word that maybe some of you haven't necessarily heard before, but once we start discussing them, I'm sure you'll recognize what they are. The elements found in nucleic acids, you notice, are now a little different than the others. We have that base of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We have nitrogen like we did in proteins, and now there's a new one, P for phosphorus. The phosphorus comes in because the building blocks of nucleic acids are something called nucleotides. When we put our nucleic acids together to build them, we're going to string along and attach nucleot nucleotides together. The nucleotides have a basic formula, kind of like we had for our general amino acid formula. There's a P, which is our phosphate group, attached to a sugar, which the sugar varies depending on what type of nucleic acid you're using. And then in the middle, there's going to be something called a nitrogenous or a nitrogen-containing base. And there are five different nitrogenous bases that can be used, A, T, U, G, and C. Now those aren't the real names, those are just the symbols for them. The uses for nucleic acids, there are two main uses in the body. The first one is for protein synthesis. Our main nucleic acid for protein synthesis is RNA, which stands for ribonucleic acid. The ribo part stands for the type of sugar that's used, which in this case is called ribose. RNA is a little different than our other nucleic acid because it only has one single strand or one side to it. So we would put these nucleic, nu nucleotides together in one strand. The other use for our nucleic acids is for our hereditary information. That's the way we pass on our traits to our offspring. The nucleic acid that's used for that is DNA, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. That's the deoxyribonucleic acid. The deoxyribo part stands for the sugar that's used, and in this case, it's called deoxyribose. In DNA's case, instead of just having one strand of nucleotides, it's actually mirror imaged almost on the opposite side. It's called a double-stranded helix, which it twists on itself. When we get into more detail for DNA, we'll look at the structure of that in quite a bit of depth. That's it for all of our organic compounds. So remember, there are four main types of organic compounds in the body. We have carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Try to find some sort of a way to remember that for yourself, and we'll discuss them in a little bit more detail as we go on with some of our lab activities and in-class activities.